Hey, Internets. So today I'd like to go over a topic that's actually a lot more important than most people realize. And that is the grifter question. Because I see a lot in my comments very often that such and such person is a grifter. Such and such YouTuber is a grifter. Such and such TikTok personality or some random guy on Twitter is a grifter. It tends to happen a lot when people are discussing various right-wing or at the very least center-right-leaning social media figures of note, which is this, again, accusation that a lot of them must be grifters. And just to make sure we are all on the same page here, what I'm generally meaning by grifter in the context of a political influencer or YouTuber or whatever, is someone who says things or professes belief in some ideas or concepts that they don't actually sincerely believe in, because they think that professing those beliefs and doing so will gain them some kind of monetary benefit. Or to put it simply, a grifter, when we're talking about those who discuss ideology, philosophy, politics, or whatever, is a person who is lying to you for money. They are insincere people who are saying whatever they think will get them cash, rather than what they actually believe to be true. Now, the thing about grifters, it's kind of a derpy accusation, because it's somewhat unfalsifiable. You can never really prove for 100% absolute certainty that someone doesn't actually believe what they're saying. Unless, of course, they regularly contradict themselves on their own moral principles using their own reasoning. But even then, it's not 100% proof that someone's a grifter. There's always the possibility that they're just not the sharpest tool in the shed. So I'm not going to be making any specific accusations in this video that anyone is a grifter. Rather, quite the opposite. I'd like to explain why some of the more well-known right-leaning influencers, such as, say, the Quartering, Sargon of Akkad, perhaps Bering, or if you want to get more into the libertarian right, you can say Prax Ben. I see a lot of random accusations that these people are grifters. And the thing is, they're probably not. Although to clarify things, I'm not endorsing or agreeing with anything any of these people say. I agree with some of them on quite a few things, but that's not the point here. My point is that they're just probably not grifters. And in this video, I'm going to be providing a lot of reasons for why I believe this to be the case. And the first of these reasons is to actually just take a look at myself, because if I was a grifter, I would absolutely be a leftist. I mean, I regularly sometimes look at myself and think, wow, if only I was a total sociopath. I could just parrot correct trademark opinions trademark all day long, never have to worry about being shadow banned, deplatformed, or demonetized or any of that, get boosted by the algorithm for parroting mainstream media opinions. No really, if I just wanted to say whatever I thought would make me money, I would delete my channel immediately. If anyone out there wondering whether or not they want to be the type of content creator I am, definitely do not get into this for the money. I've gotten that yellow dollar sign on quite a few of my videos. My recent video on communist memes got marked as 18 plus for some reason, and I basically exist at the bottom of the AdSense revenue CPM poll. If it wasn't for the fact that I had additional sources of income outside of this channel, I definitely would not be able to make the time to do this. In the current modern day climate that is still largely controlled by the cathedral, dictating what is and what is not acceptable to say, if you are anything to the right of, say, destiny, you're basically walking on eggshells. Although fortunately for me, this is something that I understood when I started my channel. I knew that I probably wouldn't be making very much money. In fact, I feel very grateful for the amount of money that I have made, even if it's not enough to support myself. Just getting the occasional Ko-Fi donation is honestly enough to make me happy. But anyways, the point is, I started this channel knowing full well that I would have the iron sights pointed at me pretty much at all times. And the thing is, everyone kind of knows this. Like, for example, when the Twitter files came out. Was anybody surprised by that? I mean, really, when evidence came to light that if you were anywhere near conservative or right-leaning in any way, there was a very good chance that your account would be getting visibility filtered, as they called it, which basically just meant shadow banned. To make a very long story short about the Twitter files is that they basically proved what a lot of people, again, already knew. The Twitter moderation team had a very, very, very strong left-wing bias. And of course, what was really interesting about this was the mainstream media's insane response to it, where they all tried to pretend like it wasn't that big of a deal. Like, for instance, this article from Vox, what the Twitter files don't tell us. Let's just take a quick look at some of their rhetoric here. They wrote, Their central accusation so far is that Twitter has long silenced conservatives or contrarian voices. And they reference internal emails, Slack messages, and content moderation systems to show how Twitter limited the reach of popular right-wing accounts like Dan Bongino, Charlie Kirk, and Libs of TikTok. But these claims and the internal documents lack crucial context. We don't have a full explanation, for example, of why Twitter limited the reach of these accounts, i.e., whether they were violating the platform's rules 
rules on hate speech, health misinformation, or violent content. Without this information, we don't know whether these rules were applied fairly or not. Now, first off, I've used to look at libs of TikTok's posts, and they absolutely were not violating the rules more than anybody else. But the real problem with Vox's reasoning here is that it completely ignores the context of power structures. What exactly specifically is misinformation? What exactly specifically is hate speech? It's very difficult to define these things in a way that is actually objective. What they ultimately boil down to is correct trademark opinions trademark, which is, of course, currently controlled by, again, the cathedral. So yes, Vox, various conservatives getting banned for wrong think by the establishment is in fact proof that the establishment considers what they are saying to be wrong think. This is why the direction of censorship is usually a pretty good bar to determine what the dominant ideology is of those in charge. What Vox is basically doing here is they're demanding a completely unrealistic standard of evidence because it's possible to really know for absolute certainty if the content moderation team on Twitter were applying the rules fairly or not, as to know that for absolute certainty we require mind reading powers. So what you have to do instead is try to look at it from more qualitative factors, to try and figure out who's in charge and what their incentives are. And this kind of ridiculous rhetoric was pretty common throughout the mainstream media when the Twitter files dropped. Constant mental gymnastics to try and pretend like it wasn't that big of a deal or that the Twitter files didn't actually prove anything. Which, ironically, in doing so, they just further proved the point. A point that I went over in one of my video responses to Second Thought on why is there so much center-left media. Which is that the cathedral or domain range of acceptable opinions is currently largely controlled by center-left liberals. And so, of course, the further away from those people you are in terms of ideology, the more likely it is what you say will be considered wrong think. This is honestly kind of obvious. And speaking of the mainstream media trying to gaslight us and pretend like this isn't happening, I'd just like to quickly go over a really bad study I saw on this once, which is this NYU false accusation report by Paul M. Barrett and J. Grant Sims. Now, I could do an entire video response on the various fallacies and instances of it's not happening, also it is happening and it's a good thing that this study goes over. But since that isn't the main focus of this video, I'll just keep it short and point out some of their main problems. First off, whether or not Trump or Biden got more engagement is completely irrelevant. Gauging things based on mainstream politicians tells you absolutely nothing about civilian influencers. Nothing at all. Plus, it doesn't tell you whether or not it's negative or positive engagement. Could just simply be that Trump is more interesting or controversial than Biden. Or it also could be that Facebook was, you know, shadow batting certain content that was critical of Biden. It's just kind of random measure based on engagement and controls for absolutely nothing. But wait, it gets even better. Their primary evidence that Facebook isn't biased against people who are on the right is because Facebook says that they don't. No, really, I'm completely serious. That's their main evidence. Facebook claims they did nothing wrong, therefore they did nothing wrong. Case closed. And then another big error is that they look at it through the lens of mainstream media, when big tech has admitted that they use different algorithms for mainstream media, corporate news sites, and the accounts of normal everyday people. And then of course there's just the obvious problem that this doesn't control for the influence of their audience that exists outside of social media. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever to use this kind of data as evidence for where big tech's biases lie, because there's outside pressure from external competition. Both means that people will directly search for this content, because again they saw it on cable TV, and of course big tech has to treat their content differently because of said external engagement. So whether or not Fox News is getting more engagement tells you absolutely nothing in how the algorithm works in regards to say some random person who has only 5,000 subscribers and of course has absolutely no external audience whatsoever. This is much worse than your typical fallacy of false comparison in comparing apples to oranges. This is like comparing apples to a freaking mountain. And even on the grounds of where we're talking about mainstream media, this doesn't really control for the fact that there's more center-left media than there is right-leaning media. So they're just not accounting for the fact that Fox News and Breitbart maybe, just maybe, were getting more engagement because they don't have as much competition. And that's pretty much how this study goes. They're only looking at the data that confirms their bias, while just completely ignoring ignoring basic common sense. A much more honest study would look at who's actually more likely to get censored. And that brings us back to say, we'll just use Sargon of Akkad as a good example. For those of you who don't know, Sargon's main channel is demonetized, and Lotus Eaters has also been demonetized. Can you name a single left-leaning influencer or breadtube channel with anywhere near the same level of engagement that got this kind of censorship treatment? I can't think of any of them. And yet Sargon is just one of many examples. So an actual honest good faith study into this subject would be to look at individual personal accounts and see which ideology was more likely to be targeted by big tech cancellations. Not look at these corporate-backed mainstream media figures. 
that tells us absolutely nothing that we didn't already know. But of course, these studies aren't going to look at that because of course these studies are not being conducted in good faith. They set out with a goal of proving the point they want to prove, even if they have to use absurd arguments and misrepresent the data in order to do it. And again, this is all pretty obvious to anybody who's been paying attention in the last eight years or so. And again, I was well aware of this when I was starting my channel. And this is especially true as a libertarian right channel. I really fully expected myself to basically earn nothing, and I'm very grateful that I earn anything at all. Now, the reason I started my channel is actually pretty simple. I got tired of the propaganda that's out there, and I just couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't live with myself knowing that I know how to dissect this propaganda and show other people what's wrong with it, and yet still sitting back and doing absolutely nothing. And now that I have done something, my only regret is that I didn't start sooner. No, really, I've said this before, but I have to say it again. I kind of owe the internet an apology. I should have thrown my hat into this ring a long time ago. I should have at the very least made that video on the Gamergate Wikipedia article during the time that the article was a current event rather than just something that the media lied about in the past. Meanwhile, on the flip side, one thing I noticed about BreadTube is that it's very, very easy to be a BreadTube leftist online these days. I mean, all you pretty much have to do is just spout correct opinions and sound somewhat articulate, and you are gold. And having even the slightest clue as to what you're talking about is certainly not necessary. Like, for example, Adam something in his video on why he thinks everyone on the libertarian right is a secret fruishist. Nutsy. I could tell straight away when watching that video pretty much immediately that this man probably doesn't even know that the Mises Institute exists, let alone has he read a single book of Austrian economics or political theory. Instead, he focused on things said by the people like Ben Shapiro. You know, a well-known, respected member of the Mises Caucus. Oh wait, he's not. But again, Adam something probably probably made this video not even knowing what the Mises Caucus is. And yet, it is this kind of misinformed slop that was just getting hundreds of thousands of views. So yeah, if you're left-leaning at all, you really can just spout correct trademark opinions trademark. And at the very least, while climbing that ladder, you don't really have to worry about being deplatformed. Which is another thing I just kind of noticed about bread tubers in general. They really don't have to worry about walking on eggshells. People like Bush and Hassan Abbey, for example, routinely state some pretty aggressive rhetoric that if said in equivalent fashion on the right would just get your channel immediately nuked. And yet, surprise surprise, they're still here because they state enough correct opinions. So if I was a grifter, I would definitely join in on this action. Because unlike bread tubers, I actually do understand these things. I actually have read Austrian economics books. I have read Rothbard. I have read Mises. I have read Hoppe. I could actually come up with some pretty ridiculous arguments based on things that right-wing libertarians actually do tend to have difficulties with. That would be much, much higher quality arguments against the right than what bread tubers are currently crapping out right now. I mean, not to sound arrogant, but if I decided to be a leftist grifter, I'd probably unironically be earning about 50 times more than I'm currently currently earning off of this. And people like Cass and Abby would probably be regularly shouting out my videos and telling everybody to check my stuff out. But unfortunately I have a conscience, so being a prestige-seeking cathedral-like grifter is very much out of the question for me. And now you might say, but wait a minute Mentis, just because you're not a grifter and you're not earning very much money and you didn't get into this for cash, that doesn't mean that other right-wingers aren't grifters. True. Again, it's pretty much impossible to know for sure if anyone's a grifter, because again, that's an accusation that requires mind reading. Again, you can come close by pointing out hypocrisy, but again, there's always the chance that they're just not very smart. But the thing is, what I've just said about myself largely applies to other right-leaning figures as well. For instance, let's talk about the quartering for a bit. Now, unlike me, the quartering, I'm pretty sure, does actually earn enough money to support himself off of just his channel alone. And I guess he has that coffee business too. And so you might say, well, he's earning enough money to support himself, so maybe he could be a grifter. And I sincerely doubt it. Because here's the thing. If Jeremy ever ends up watching this video, I can almost guarantee you that he's going to be lightly laughing at quite a bit of it. Because he knows that everything I just stated is absolutely absolutely correct. You see, it's true that Jeremy is able to earn money through being a political influencer, slash social commentary specialist, or honestly, whatever you want to call it. But the thing is, he'd be earning even more money if he had correct opinions. Because another thing I've noticed when going over various BreadTube and Kami channels is that they make quite a lot of money despite very little effort, with it being not uncommon at all for them to have thousands of Patreon subscribers, which admittedly has nothing to do with the algorithm, but again, this video isn't about the algorithm or so much what gets shadow banned and what gets you demonetized. Again, the topic I'm intending this to be about is whether or not right-wing influencers are grifters or not, and how cancel culture is a very strong incentive 
against being a right-wing influencer at all. Oh, and by the way, just in case you're wondering how this pertains to the quartering, he was banned from Patreon. So yeah, commies are allowed to just basically espouse their ridiculous authoritarian rhetoric, while a generic center-right social commentator gets banned. I guess it really do just be like how it is. But anyways, the point I am making here is that if you want to earn any kind of money making intellectual content in Clown World, the obvious incentive right now is to make content that tells people that Clown World is perfectly fine. If you want to earn cash, the smartest thing to do is to grab up that microphone and get really good at coming up with rhetoric for how you're going to tell people how the West's slow decay into socialism is actually a good thing. And it's not exactly difficult. The basics of being a leftist political influencer and social commentator is to paint your target audience as victims of capitalism and then to paint yourself as their hero. Your typical BreadTube video essentially boils down to saying, we are the victims of capitalism and I am here to help guide us out of this oppression. Hashtag Patreon. It is of course very silly and very dumb. And as I pointed out in my more recent video on Second Thought, they largely rely on the flawed reasoning of conflating capitalism with scarcity and then equivocating between between those two things as if they are the same. Which is of course a very dumb argument when you understand why it's dumb. But it does not matter because people will fall for it and you are in absolutely zero danger of getting deplatformed for saying it. And I know that what I'm saying doesn't actually prove with absolute certainty that there aren't any grifters on the right wing side of YouTube, politics, and social commentary. My point is just that the current power structures that be very, very strongly disincentivize against doing this if you actually want to earn money. And so before you start making accusations of who and who isn't a grifter, it is important to remind ourselves how those power structures work. Anyways, that's all for now. If you liked the video, feel free to like, subscribe, or leave a comment for an algorithm. Or hey, you could leave me a tip. Ho ho ho, I'm grifting now. I'm probably not going to get that many tips, but it's okay. Again, a big reason I just make these videos is because I enjoy it. But yeah, again, thanks for watching. Till next time.